Hi, everybody. My name is Dr. David P. Proden, and welcome to the week six fireside chat for educational leadership, 655 pupil services, and non discrimination with Viterbo University in La Crosse, Wisconsin. This week begins on Monday, February 26th, and concludes on Sunday, March 3rd, 2024. A recap. Child and human trafficking. Many of you found limited professional development resources in your district. This might be an area that would be best addressed as a consortium professional development event. Also, expect that your CISA or state organizations dig into this uncomfortable area and increase the level of professional development available to your district. Embrace and step into the advocacy role. Will you be the one who contacts your elected officials and sits down with them for coffee and chats with them about the needs of people's services? Are you going to contact OSA or WCAS? Are you going to write a letter to the editor or have an article published in an educational journal? Will you testify for the reauthorization of IDEA? Maybe go on PBS or maybe even write a book. Keep an open mind. You have a lot of value. And advocacy is a substantial part of the people services role. We're going to really see that in this upcoming week. I will return your graded learning team assignment by March 10th. And a few things about your assignment with Bruce. One is the EpiPen. So just a couple tips here that I learned. Nurse shared with me that after a year, EpiPens expire, but don't throw them out. You can take them and grab a grapefruit and stab that grapefruit with an EpiPen. So staff get the authentic feeling, right, of that auto injector and, and how it works. Um, of course, don't eat the grapefruit after that, but, uh, but instead of just throwing it out that they actually have an authentic experience with that. Um, also, EpiPens, uh, if you approach your insurance carrier, pharmacies, Lions Club, uh, to donate EpiPens to your school so you have them in more than just one location, which might be um, the dining area. I learned also if an EpiPen is administered, um, it's a tip from an EMT, write down on your arm in marker, write down on the child's arm, the time that the EpiPen was delivered. Probably not this, this marker, but um, that way you keep a course of records as a child exits your school and is, is then um, in an ambulance and, and obviously being transported. What was the actual time that the EpiPen was administered? There's a certain window there that the EpiPen uh, does extinguish the effects, but then it does wear off after that. So that's just another tip to share out there. Week six, shout outs. All right, Rich wrote, if the Board of Education asked me to give a presentation on the district's efforts to prevent opioid overdoses, I would first want to surround myself with experts in the field. I would reach out to my school health office and might even consider preparing and presenting with the health office during the school board meeting in my district. Our lead custodian is also a licensed EMT, which would be important not only to include within my presentation, but also to have as a lead person for the planning process. Yes. I may also reach out to county agencies to make certain that my presentation is based on factual data. Wow. Rich, you did a tremendous job answering this question. One, you also found your internal experts, right? So it is a custodian uh, who also is an EMT. And sometimes we, we don't dig that deep. We don't find out if people are EMTs or been in the fire department or were in the National Guard or, or were in the military, right? And, and some of the skills that they might have acquired during that time or still maintained. So... Um, I commend you on your due diligence to become informed on the matter of opioid antagonist in the school setting. Your steps, again, are impeccable, especially that balance of that macro information, you know, getting information from our county health services, getting information uh, from, you know, Mayo Clinic, whatever it might be. And then also you have your community EMT there reaching out to the, the fire department. You have your health office. You have different ways that you're informing your decision from a macro level and from a micro level, like right there in the building. That is excellent. As 
they state it in Education Leadership 651 in the fall of 2023, it's often more important how you informed your decision versus the actual decision. Furthermore, you're on the mark with broadening an opioid presentation to include experts, perhaps someone from your county uh, human services or from a proximal hospital. Um, And there's another opportunity here to kind of lean into that community health needs assessment, which we talked about in class, and to start to figure out who your contacts are there. And if the community health needs assessment um, has written anything about this or the next time they convene, right, that, that this is introduced into that community health needs assessment of what services they are offering to schools, specifically opioid antagonists and in the community. So anyway, you did an awesome job answering that question. Amy wrote, one year, we also held a training for parents around vapes and fentanyl when vapes just came to the market and the start of the fentanyl epidemic. However, more recently, we have not had any education for staff, parents, or families and community. Amy, I I appreciate it. Your post underscores a reality that countless school practices were interrupted by the pandemic. And some of those have yet to resume. For example, a principal shared with me that his school hasn't hosted a family movie night uh, since the pandemic. And this was something they did every month and noted a lingering hesitation to bring families back together into a group setting. So we had a lot of disruption in 2020 and 2021, um, and not everything has come back online. We also see this right with, with truancy, which is part of people services, uh, students not attending schools. So to take inventory of what hasn't restarted and then to do whatever you have to do to juice that up to get that going again. So uh, thanks for pointing that out because I think there are a lot of things that we, we've we kind of lost or there's entropy in certain systems, certain activities, and we need to look at those and bring those back, the ones that were effective, as you noted. Audrey wrote that as a pupil services director, there are action steps that can be taken to start the conversation about bringing awareness, interest, and embracing race, culture, and gender in our schools. For example, the resource and equity tool is released in SAFE to school districts in the spring. Again, that's with the Department of Public Instruction. It was shared in class. This tool is a self-analysis that has districts look at student enrollment while identifying race, ethnicity, and student groups. Again, it is shared in class. Find Audrey's uh, link. It is the uh, um, resource and equity tool from the Department of Public Instruction. Audrey, thank you for sharing the link to the DPI's resource um, for the equity data tool. That's invaluable. Among the data points highlighted within that tool, the statistic um, that kind of just popped out at me was the 40.9% of students belonging to the economically disadvantaged student group uh, that, again, was particularly striking. It reminded me of an experience in a course facilitated by Dr. Art Rainwater, the retired Madison Metropolitan School District superintendent when I was going for my educational leadership uh, degrees and licenses, right? During one class session, he conducted an illuminating exercise where aspiring school leaders, including myself, were tasked with identifying components of diversity within schools. And we hastily listed items on a whiteboard focusing on race and special education. When we were all done, Dr. Rainwater astutely pointed out that we never included economically disadvantaged students. He said that tended to be the pattern in this activity. It was it was an oversight. So again, um, the tool that Audrey shared helps us to be comprehensive and kind of uh, mitigate those uh, unintentional oversights. In Moodle, school safety is now part of the formal or informal job description of every pupil services director. This is addressed in greater depth in Educational Leadership 651, Special Education Legal Issues that I instruct in fall. So some of this information might be redundant, but it is worthy of being repeated. And now you will look at the information from the Director of Pupil Services Lens. School safety, crisis preparedness, investigations, K-12 counseling scope and sequence, 
all in Moodle, especially that K-12 scope and sequence. You can modify that. And that's a living document. That's where you're getting together with your school counselors and psychologists and, and principals, uh, you know, at least twice a year, if not more, or you have it as a dynamic document where people can say, hey, now we're doing this at third grade, or we're doing this at eighth grade, 11th grade, and we're going to adjust the document to uh, represent that, whether it be har harassment education or trafficking um, or about opioids, right? So you, you can just kind of keep working across. The document is a terrific template. It is also very valuable when your board of education asks, well, what are we doing to prevent uh, this? Or what are we doing to educate about this? And you can go right to that and say, here's what we do in this category at second grade, at fifth grade, and, and kind of work it. So um, I think it's very important to map out your resources in that manner. The FEMA School Multi-Hazard Emergency Planning Course, that is due March 9th. Just provide your certificate. You'll get a PDF certificate. Um, assume the lens of a pupil services director as you complete that course. Again, what does that mean if you, you have students with uh, OHI, with anxiety, um, uh, English language learners, uh, again, students with disabilities. Okay, keep the certificate, include it with your resume. It's something I recommend that you take with other administrators. Um, those FEMA courses are free and they're very efficient. My PBS school presentations, matters of mental health and student profiling. You'll be able to kind of churn that. Um, examples of the five-year DPI Pupil Services Non-Discrimination Report. Your district completes one on a five-year schedule. See if you're even able to locate it. Balance quantitative with qualitative. So quantitative are your numbers. Qualitative are your interviews. People go really high on the quant and really thin on the qualitative but that's not what we want to do. We want to have quotes from teachers and from students and community members, right, to go along with our report. We want it to be very rich, very vibrant. And I think that qualitative side of sitting down with a focus group of students at elementary and middle and high school, right, can inform that. A lot of people don't do that, but you really need to do that. You need to go beyond the numbers and pair the numbers up with that qualitative School counseling, again, that, that scope and sequence, um, add headings as they become relevant. For example, now, you know, certainly increased um, awareness around trafficking. That wasn't something that necessarily was in that document when we created that. Pupil services, hey, the legal question and answer, getting your attorney involved. Um, think of frequently asked questions about pupil services, such as custody issues, harassment via social media etc. This type of presentation is always best to do in the format of providing the questions to the attorney ahead of time and then sticking to that set of questions during the presentation. An attorney will seldom and shouldn't answer complex questions in the moment. So the attorney is going to want time to research these questions and to see how they've been responded to perhaps in court cases, right? And what other uh, legal updates surround these. So then the attorney comes in and says, here's how this is, has been handled. And here are some options, approaches that you might want to consider as a district or sit down with you ahead of time. And you can have that guidance kind of laid out so it meshes with your district's approach. Again, you, you want to make sure that what the attorney is saying aligns with your policy and practices. But I've found that to always be a very, a very welcomed activity from staff because these questions come up, custody issues, right, or harassment via social media. And to have that formally discussed at the start of the year uh, by the attorney is very valuable. I kind of keep a notebook and, and write these questions down as they come up. And, and when I get to about eight or 10 questions, um, I might talk to the superintendent and say, hey, I want to share these out with the attorney. And then the attorney would broadly answer those questions. And we can come back and talk about those um, during staff professional development. Reflective teaching annotation litigation is almost impossible to avoid in today's schools. Although it's not frequent, 
it, over the term of your career, right? Act in the best interest of the child document and be aware of Board of Education policy. Most school legal issues are procedural in nature. Again, it's how you informed your decisions that you're reviewing your Board of Education policies, for example, uh, within a five-year uh, schedule. Um, but again, procedural, making sure that, that you are following your Board of Education policies, you're following your procedures. Review your own job description. You might find you're responsible for an area where you've had no training or support resources. I had somebody share with me as a director their job description and included director of safety. And they're like, whoa, I have to submit the Department of Justice January 1st safety document. I didn't know <laughs> who am I working with on this, right? So looking through because those are essential items. School of Errors, Rethinking School Safety in America, extensively discusses the benefits of various school tabletop exercises. As a pupil services director, you'll need to anticipate the needs of students with disabilities, anxiety, ELL, in the event of a power outage, cyber attack, evacuation, or intruder. In the syllabus, we can six and week seven are together from school of heirs read chapter 18 instant command structure and also chapter 28 bollards and planters think about the pupil services director's expectations to understand instant command systems and also about accessibility and safety devices meaning there are a number of safety devices that could promote it to schools hey put this in it'll keep your classroom safer but what does that do as far as uh, accessibility? Uh, if there's a code that you have to punch in on a wall to enter or exit a building now, is that going to be a barrier for a student in a classroom who is in early childhood or a student who uh, has uh, intellectual disability, right? So we wanna make sure that we're not introducing safety items that um, create these additional barriers. The final assignment, you have a paper existing pupil services practices, but you can do that as a phone call final. It is 20 minutes. I bring out the timer and we make sure it's only 20 minutes, um, but it's uh, fast and furious. We go through that. Um, I will provide a shared Google document with several appointment dates and times. Look for that to be posted around the middle of March. I'll make an announcement when I post it. Um, I also think that's a good way to reflect at the end and how you might have these, these elevator discussions, um, you know, with people, or if you're presenting with your board of education to make sure that you're very concise, let's keep it rolling. Um, just a couple more weeks and then you are into your research module and we are kind of getting closer to the end of this class kind of feels like it. And it's been 60 degrees outside. Again, um, your assignment for Bruce is due. Only one person needs to upload it. And please don't put a lot of color in it because my printer back there would be very sad if you did that.